who, at what level, from top to bottom, can carry the message and find the way to surface those individuals as candidates. We should never meet again after this meeting where someone can ask the question, name one member of Congress who is four square committed to enforcing the equal protection of the laws for all Americans without being able to name at least one. It should become a task for you to see that that will never happen again. Someone, somewhere, is honest enough, wise enough, and true enough to carry the weight of the mission. Hopefully there's more than just one, but every journey begins with a single step. Think about that. If you cannot find one of the presidential candidates who responds to that, think about being skeptical about giving weight to any. There comes a time when you have to make decisions, not on the short-term benefit, but on the basis of the ultimate principle. I don't recommend doing everything that way all the time. Because we live in the world in which it's really important to understand why we choose the next best thing. Often the best choice we can make is the next best thing, not the best thing. We all have to accept that. That's prudential judgment. And in politics, always prudential judgment is going to be the rule. But there comes a time in the life of every country when people must do what George Washington did at the hour of the American Revolution, which is to declare that I have set my standard and there is no turning back. There is no compromise. Either we get to the promised land or we simply suffer the consequences of defeat. But there is no turning back. These are rare moments in our lives. These are not everyday moments. We don't deal with everything that way. That's called extremism. But there are some times when we must make that judgment is this the hour where we take a stand? And if it is, can we make it stick? And that's got to be a decision that people make together once they've undertaken a common mission. To speak of federal Indian policy in the context and in the presence of a group that's called the Citizens' Equal Rights Alliance, necessarily produces certain paradoxical kinds of associations. For the group's name says that federal Indian policy is not on the agenda. Right? That's what the group's name says. And I think that's true. But it is also true that the group deals with the reality that federal Indian policy is in the way. So you've got to get past it. That means you've got to overcome it in order to pursue what is your real mission. I believe that can be done. I believe you can attain that. I've given you two tasks to carry out, to practical, to concrete tasks. But there, of course, stands beneath those two tasks the one broad task. And that broad task is to sustain the richness of scholarship, the richness of practical judgment, the richness of sharing that has already made you what you are. What you've done in many, many quarters will command respect. And I assure you that day will come. The day will come when people will say, this is where these legal theories arose. This is what helps us understand the nature of the American Constitution. That day will come. The day will come when people will say, this is what it means to have respect for one another. 
to treasure our diverse heritages without making ourselves prisoners of an ideology of diversity. That day will come, and it will come because of what you're contributing, because of your practical judgment, and because of your moral seriousness. Those two things in combination are powerful, powerful, so long as you keep them together. So don't turn to cynicism. Don't decide that your only option is to work incrementally, to make small requests in these visits you're going to be making on Capitol Hill. Oh, no. Make no small request. Remember what your goal is. Remember that when you leave someone, the one impression you want them to have in that office is that you are serious. You take your American citizenship seriously. That it is a possession, a treasure, and that you will not trifle with it. Make them understand that, whatever else you have to say to them. So I leave you with this then. The work has been done in terms of background. You know the history. You know the experiences. What remains is to keep it alive and share it with others and to push to the next level. The next level means making certain that your voices are heard. And I don't care what accent the voice is spoken in. You know, I'll say this one other thing before I complete that conclusion, just so that you understand exactly where I'm coming from. There's a new museum here in town. I hope you've all gone to visit it. It's called the Museum of the American Indian. I was extremely happy when that museum was constructed, and happier still when I saw how it was named. It was called the Museum of the American Indian, not the Museum of the Native American. The political correctness that tells us that we need to use expressions like Native American or indigenous or aboriginal and avoid the term Indian is a further expression of disrespect for people. We all know what Indian means. It means Columbus was lost. <laughs> it's not a pejorative term. And it wasn't a term that robbed anybody's humanity. All these other terms do more than indicate a people. They also try to describe a people's state of existence, state of being. It says something about them. It calls them primitive or whatever. All that we want to recognize in our fellow citizens who are Indian is that they are human beings. And Columbus's era does that better than any of these politically correct terms. With that kind of understanding, knowing then that your moral seriousness is predicated upon recognizing our common humanity, your practical endeavors will assure that others can become equally committed to full citizenship for each and every one of us.